Hi, Mage fans. This is Terry Robinson, your host at Mage the Podcast. And today we are doing a special interview with writer James Davey. During this walkthrough of James' game, we are going to discuss the Midnight World, but keep an ear out for things that we can jam directly into Mage the Ascension. It's a game with infinite paradigms and possibilities, and to me... Part of that is being willing to recklessly steal mechanics and ideas from other games. And when I saw The Midnight World, I thought it was ripe for that. And I look forward to going through and doing that with its creator, no less. Uh, James and James's co-writer, Jim, are in the process of doing a Kickstarter for The Midnight World, which is a game that explores how we can have something that kind of looks like the world of darkness, but it has its own mythos and world, but also how do we get PTSD, trauma, and let's say neuroatypical states properly represented into a game. Is that a reasonable rundown? That's pretty close to what, we, what we're going for. We looked at a lot of games. When we first came back from Iraq, we were both combat veterans. We both have struggled during our years with PTSD and anxiety and depression. And we were looking specifically at World of Darkness games. We were, it's at the genesis of what would become the Midnight World was a game that we ran in Hunter the Vigil, which is World of Darkness 2.0. But one of the things that we saw in there that we didn't really love was that a World of Darkness properties have always tried to handle mental illness illness in a way that makes some sense, but it just felt unsatisfying to us. It felt almost commodified. It it felt like these You know, either you would have these mental, these derangements that were completely ignorable. To to explain, that's derangement with a capital D, the game term. Can you can you give a quick one or two sentence on what a derangement is? Oh yeah, so derangements in the world of darkness are the negative effects of certain mental illness disorders in the real world, and 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 White Wolf was trying very hard, I think, to make a mechanical reflection of those things that would feel respectful. I mean, they didn't read as disrespectful. But what we found was that they read as either, like I said, easy to ignore or completely bonkers character ruining to the point where this this is all your character was, was this derangement. Yeah, Yeah, no one wants to have to role play a character with obsessive compulsive disorder who literally feels compelled to count every bathroom tile in a public area. You have the problem of how do we portray this accurately, but how do we also introduce it in a game? And it is very easy to mess that up one way or the other. Right. We think that what was done sort of what could have been done better was that White Wolf and other games like it uh, or like, you know, that use the storyteller system would make these big sweeping diagnoses like my character has schizophrenia or my character has depression. What we wanted to do was boil those things down into symptoms, make mechanical ramifications for those symptoms and make those symptoms something that your character, that are part of your character, but aren't your character. Uh, because one of the things that we always didn't like was that as sufferers of PTSD, most forms of art that we've seen that use PTSD uh, as a storytelling device make it where that is just the central thesis of that character. And that's not the central thesis of a person with PTSD, where uh, in most cases, perfectly functional people. So we wanted to encapsulate what it might feel like. And we were playing uh, that Hunter the Vigil game and we had sort of added this mechanic and people saw it and they said, hey, this is this might be something. So that was five years ago. Now, were those uh, symptoms, I, I will call them symptoms with a capital S, they had a mechanical backing to them. What was the tie then to the game? I think in some games, as you advance your power stat, You get bad things that go along with it. For instance, in Changeling the Lost, as your weird rating goes up, you also pick up these other kind of down things. When did these symptoms, capital S, come into play in the game? You actually described two different mechanics in our game. So with the the symptoms, we call them challenges. Uh, And challenges can be anything. Challenges don't have to necessarily be mental illness symptoms. Think of challenges the way that you would think of flaws in Mage. They're very similar, and they can be across the gamut of mental, social, physical, or supernatural challenges. They don't tend to hit as hard as flaws do, and they're not tiered by point base. So they just they're all the same, and they're 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 minorly annoying for the most part. Can you give a couple examples of what those might be maybe in each of those axes? So one of the uh, mental ones is anhedonia, 
And for anybody who does know a lot about mental uh, health, anhedonia is a symptom of depression. And it is the symptom where it is very difficult for you to enjoy things that you used to enjoy. So if you have the challenge anhedonia, what that means is it is much harder for your character to experience comfort. So if a terrible thing happens and you need to bleed off some distress – it's harder for you because, you know, for me in, in my I, I do struggle with depression and in and, and, and anhedonia specifically. And what happens is I, I sit there at my Steam account and I buy game after game after game and play like five minutes of it and be like, this isn't it. This isn't it. This isn't it. And then I go to bed angry. Anybody who's ever experienced that will know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, and in, in, in our game, what that does is, again, it just makes it where if you are exposed to something terrible, most people can be like, well, I'm going to cuddle my teddy bear and I'll feel better. You can cuddle your your teddy bear and you will feel better, but not nearly as fast or as completely as somebody who's not suffering that. Just to dwell on how we could pull that into World of Darkness, uh, the two things that immediately jump out at me would be uh, someone someone dealing with that challenge all of a sudden is not able to participate in maybe proffering glamour to a changeling event or alternatively a wraith looking to generate pathos via joy may have that avenue cut off. So this is one of those cases where you could theoretically bring it into a game, even if one of your characters isn't dealing with it. You can represent it mechanically for an NPC. Even from that, there is something that we can steal. What were the other ones, or what did you want to go into next? Oh, just yeah, just some, some other examples. Some non-mental health examples would be things like Unlucky. Unlucky is one of the worst. Uh, we may do a revision pass on it, because uh, what Unlucky does is... At any point in the game, once per game session, if you roll a phenomenal success, which is a critical success, the ST steals it from you and replaces it with a critical failure. And and there's stuff like that. Those are challenges. Uh, But the core mechanic of the game, or I would say not the core mechanic, but the core loop of the game is one of anxiety. Every character in the Midnight World has anxiety. Because when you really boil anxiety down as a mental health symptom, it is connected to just about every single diagnosis there is. Generalized anxiety disorder is a diagnosis, but anxiety is a symptom usually. And so uh, the way that our game works, that the core loop of our game is that early on in the game, you're very good at things but you're a little nervous that you might start screwing things up. And then when you do screw something up the first time, you get worse at things. And that makes you afraid that you're going to screw things up again. And that makes it more likely that you're going to screw things up again. And then you do, and that makes it more likely that you're going to screw things up again. And there's just this this weight that starts being added to you throughout the game as your character gets less and less effective at things that they're normally good at because they are becoming more and more anxious about what failure might mean. Uh, And anybody who's ever had anxiety knows that feeling, that, that cycle, that grist mill. You mentioned anxiety. Can you give us a definition of that and maybe, and can you differentiate between anxiety, worry, and maybe fear? Or like, how, how do we know something is anxiety-ish versus, versus other feelings that seem to be similar to it? And maybe why anxiety can be so debilitating? Sure. So anxiety, couching it in the terms of a horror game, is dread. Just the feeling of impending doom, that something is going to happen, and that whatever that thing is, is going to be the end of all things. Um, Any, you know, worry, worry and anxiety, I think, go pretty hand in hand. I think anxiety tends to be a little rougher. Fear tends to be a very punctuated moment. And that's one of the, the, the concepts we play with. We originally did not want to call the Midnight World a horror tabletop. because, But we don't utilize fear the way that Call of Cthulhu does. We do have it. It is there. But we see fear as a sort of short, sharp trick. And anxiety is what we're really going for. We want characters not necessarily players, but characters by the end of a session to have that weight on their chest, their heart to be pumping nonstop, their pupils to be dilated because they are just 100% sure that something terrible is about to happen. How does that differ from tension? I think it only differs insofar as that uh, with anxiety, it's a very personal thing. Tension, I think the whole group tends to know that. The, but with anxiety, each character is at, like, at a different place 
you may have a character who has been able to remain relatively upbeat through this whole thing and is talking everybody else down. And you may have one person uh, who's been exposed nonstop. We do have trauma triggers in this game, and we we very specifically state in the book, and we're very we're very hard on this point. The term trigger is not funny to us. We are people who suffer PTSD. We use it appropriately. And if your character has been exposed to their trauma trigger throughout the session, they may be a barely functional mess by the end of it. And there may be a person there who's been exposed to their solace trigger the whole time. And their solace trigger is the counteract, uh, the counteracting point. And they may be perfectly calm and they may be talking you down with tension is sort of a group thing and anxiety is sort of a personal thing. So anxiety is something a person experiences. Tension is something that a scene generates or Correct. something yep. that a story would have. Now, you yep. mentioned the term t- trauma trigger. I know trauma trigger as some sort of stimulus that prompts the recall of something traumatic that, that starts what is usually a, a negative cycle that is self-reinforcing. Do you use it as a gaming term of art here, like trigger capital T, or do you use it the, the colloquial sense? So it is It is both. Okay. Uh, what trauma triggers do in our game, one of the things that I think is really sets our game apart from anything that I've played before, and one of the reasons we wanted to build this game, is that every single character in this game is what we call touched. At some point in history, in their, in their personal history, they have come into contact with the supernatural, the, the horrifying and the memory of that event has always stuck with them up to the point where the character creation in this game is the generation of that memory. Everything else is secondary to the generation of the memory. And that memory will include with it things that are similar enough that they make you recall it. And those will be your trauma triggers. So, for instance, if your character saw one of our fragments is that you may have at some point seen a child that seemed to be created entirely of living flame and they were whispering something weird at you. And now, you know, 30 years later, flickering lights still set you off. You still recall that moment and as that happens once you're exposed to your trauma your trauma trigger you begin to rapidly gain what we call distress and distress is a sort of sub mechanic that just screws everything up the longer it goes the more of it you accrue the term you used before was a fragment what is a fragment and what could some of those be in terms of major world of darkness I'll start with what they are in our game. So in our game, the way that character creation, th- there are three ways to create your character. And the one that I think most people will be most familiar with is you just, you go through the book and you create your character. I think a lot of people will want to do that and that's fine. But we have a couple of other ways that we think are really cool. The one that I am proudest of is a simple, quick five rolls with a D20 and your whole character is done. What those five rolls are is we have a memory fragment chart. And what we did is I sat down with my brother and some family members. And I said, okay, separately, not all as one group. I I pulled them aside and I said, tell me the story of that thing that happened to you. Because we've all got that one weird story from high school or college. And I said, tell me that weird story. And I took notes, not on what the story they were telling me was, but the way that they were telling it to me. And what I noticed, and I wrote down the blocks that seemed to be common in all of these stories. And and they were, once when I was doing something, I saw something, all I could think to do was, then the thing, and ever since then. So I created a chart, just D20, 20 pieces for each of those six blocks. It's six blocks, not five. But each of those six blocks, there's a D20 roll associated with it. And you just roll a D20, go down, and find the block. And that block creates your whole character sheet. And one thing I, I would think that the way that we did this in Hunter the Vigil, because we did use this mechanic, was it didn't necessarily have an effect on the character sheet, but we used it in Hunter the Vigil to create the trauma trigger and the solace trigger and assign merits and flaws. When you were exposed to your trauma trigger, it started to drain your casting stat. So in Mage, it would being being exposed to it would start pulling your um a retail down or your willpower your, your down. Retail, yeah. Right. Or start draining your willpower. Yeah, absolutely. In our game it does something entirely different, and that is that it adds distress. It adds minutes to your clock, which 
I'm sure we'll get to. Yeah. But the clock <laughs> is the central mechanic of our game. So you mentioned these D20s. That sounds like a hypothetical die that is like the D10 that we all know from the World of Darkness, but possibly with 10 additional sides, maybe extending into other dimensions. These a are bizarre horrible. non-Euclidean okay, polygon. Got it. Got it. Got it. Because I'm only familiar with those. I, I got some good news for you, and I got some bad news for you vis-a-vis the Midnight World. Drop it on me, James. The first is that you're going to be very familiar with the system when you see it, because it is not accurate to say it is a modified storytelling system game. It's not. It is It is a, it is, it is a, it is a very different game, but if you've played any point-per-die system, Shadowrun, any World of Darkness game, other point-per-die systems, it's going to be a very familiar game. The bad news is there's one weird thing that happens in World of Darkness games that we don't like. And that is this. If I am a concert pianist and I have been training for 35 years to play concert piano, but I'm sort of a clumsy dude, I have the exact same chance of mastering Beethoven's Ninth as a guy who is very dexterous and kind of knows what a piano is. Got it. So one dexterity plus four performance is the same as four dexterity and one performance. Exactly. So what we've done is we've weighted things a little differently. In our game, your attributes are going to be D6s and your skills are going to be D8s because your skills should matter more than your attributes. Okay, and to convert that into Old World of Darkness, that's attributes or D6s, uh, abilities would be would be D8. Correct. Okay, yep. cool. So my skills, my talents, and my knowledges are going to use a, a higher dice. And, right. And the way New World of Darkness kind of deals with that is if you don't have an appropriate dot in an ability, you are you are penalized a certain number of dice, and you have a different way of doing it by changing the the die that is used. But D6s right. are ubiquitous. They're out there. I guess one could use these D8s, or or I could, <laughs> I'll just use my D10s and ignore nines and zeros. And you I'll, can just do that. Yeah. yeah, I'll just I'll just blank them out. I'll take a sharpie the, to them, and I'll be the right. Truth in the world. matter is, if you if you look at, a, at the Midnight World sheet, you will be familiar with it enough that if you if you say, you know, I don't like their dice mechanic. You can just sub in D10s. Mm-hmm. It's fine. Um, and we do say in our book that this is our justification behind changing this and doing this, and this is why we're doing it this way. But we also have a sidebar in our book that says, look, once this book leaves the publisher and is in your hands, it's your book. You run it how you want to. And likewise, you can do the opposite. One of the limiting things in D10s is there's only so many special ways you can treat something. If you want to have a specialty and that allows a character to still have difficulty 7, 8, 9, but you get to roll a D12 or something like that, that is a perfectly reasonable way to represent that you have a, a specialty in something. Uh, so they're playing with the number of die faces is becoming a more and more common way of shifting the probability distribution and representing either uh deficits or or great things. Now, you've mentioned a couple of things so far. Uh, One, the solace mechanic. Can we get a a, a sentence on that? All right, so I'll start with solace triggers. Uh, We talked about what trauma triggers do. They add distress to your sheet. Uh, And 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 again, when I say distress, we keep screwing this up because we we should be saying minutes, but we haven't talked about the clock yet. So I'm going to call it distress until we talk about the clock. But they add distress to your sheet. Each point of distress that you accrue has a negative mechanical ramification. Solace triggers just literally do the opposite of that. So it is it is equivalent to, and for anybody who does have PTSD or anxiety or, or any form of mental illness that revolves around centering or cognitive behavioral therapy as the main treatment for it, when you feel yourself starting to ramp up or when you are in the presence of something that is causing your trauma to resurface, you internalize, refocus on that thing that that calms you down and you, you just try to keep that in your mind. And so we just do the exact same thing as actual cognitive behavioral therapy in this game. When you're exposed to the trauma, the, your next step, as soon as you can, first of all, is to get away from it as soon as possible. And the second step is to find that thing. Uh, and they can be cooking is one of them, sharing conversation with a close friend. One of them is drinking whiskey alone. And it is one of the two mechanics by which you can bleed distress off. The other is to just give in to the distress. Just say, fine, screw it, and push yourself through. You basically are saying, I'm going to pay for this later, but right now I have to get through this moment. So you've talked about this clock, or with this unit of minutes and hours. What is the clock? The clock. Uh, so the clock is the center. I mean, obviously, the Midnight World, our, our symbology is all clocks. And so the Midnight World uses... One of the things that anybody who's ever suffered anxiety knows, anybody who's especially ever suffered PTSD, you mentioned obsessive compulsive disorder earlier, anybody who has a mental disorder that can be triggered will tell you 
that once a triggering occurs, it's like a clock has been set in motion. You are going to have an event. You can postpone it. You can mitigate it so that it's not as terrible, but it is going to happen, and there is not really anything you can do to fully stop it. So we really wanted to have that as part of the core mechanic of our game, is all of these characters are sufferers of some mental disorder, and from the time that thing happened to them, that clock started in motion. But we wanted to make it a little bit more nuanced. So what we've done is we've, we've got three hands on your clock. Now, all hands only have 12 segments because we didn't want to be too complicated. Plus, we tested 60 seconds, and it was bonkers. Uh, so from lowest to highest, seconds are willpower. That's just the best way to describe them. You can spend them for extra successes on hit or uh, rolls. You can spend them to remove distress from you. You can spend them for various effects. Minutes are distress. For every two minutes you have on the clock two, four, six, eight, and ten, you get one D4 added to your roll. What those do is, you're familiar with the old World of Darkness mechanic, where when you rolled a one on, your, on anything, it subtracted a hit. Well, in the Midnight World, your primary dice pool ones don't matter, but on those D4s, they do. Every one on a D4 will remove a hit from your pool. So what we find is that when a person first plays the game, and they've got one of those D4s. They're like, man, this game's too easy. It's basically impossible to fail. And at the end of that session, they're like, look, man, please don't make me roll to check the mail. Because if you do, there's going to be a bomb in there and I'm going to die because I have five freaking distress dice in everything <laughs> I do. So, uh, And that's what we wanted. We wanted a, a slow, steady ramp up of tension and anxiety. So when you start the game, you don't really have any of these D4s. By the end of a session, you have four or five and every roll is nail-biting edge of your seat. I hope I don't screw this up. And then hours at 1 o'clock, 1 p.m., you had that encounter a long time ago. At 11 p.m., you're basically not of this world anymore. We have also tied your power level to that. So your hour hand does not just describe how disconnected from reality you are. It also describes how many powers you have, how many points you have for skills and, and uh, attributes. So an 11 p.m. character is going to have a pretty big sheet, but everything they do will cost them minutes to use. And we have made a, a solid policy of not telling people what happens when your character hits midnight. Something happens, and it is potentially devastating for everybody around you when it does. Is that narratively defined? It is defined narratively in the book. Uh, the The main reason that we haven't gone out and just told people what it is yet that happens uh, is partially because I really have enjoyed hearing the rumors that people have come up with. And a couple of people have hit it right on the head exactly what happens when you hit midnight. We are willing to say before you get the book in your hands is that we wanted to come up with something. When you hit zero sanity... In Call of Cthulhu, your character's insane and you can't play them anymore. Well, what does that mean? My character's insane. I don't know. Make a new character. Yeah. yeah. I don't like it. Or zero uh, humanity in Vampire or... Right. Yeah. To, to remap this back to Mage, it sounds like this would be is if in Mage we have Paradox, the Paradox track, which is sometimes becomes the quiet track, right. which is as I accumulate Paradox that I haven't bled off, the universe kind of starts changing because of my presence and, and mutating. And this is generally correlated, but not necessarily directly correlated with a Rite. In this case, you have intimately tied the two together. So you have that. Does the clock ever go backwards? With seconds... The clock never goes backwards. It can only go forward. When you hit 12 seconds, you gain a minute. With minutes, minutes is the only one that can go backwards, and the only way it can go backwards is, well, so there's, there's a couple of ways it can go backwards, but the primary way that it goes backwards is engaging in your solace trigger. So minutes are gained through things like using powers. By the very nature of reaching through the multiverse and pulling out some magical effect, you are causing yourself distress because your mind is having to consider, I just did that. But also being exposed to your trauma trigger or even just seeing something horrible that you're not used to. You know, I walk into the police station and I see a bunch of corpses on the floor. I'm going to gain a couple of minutes from that. Um, engaging in your solace trigger can allow you to bleed minutes off. Our does not go back either. And so what we've specifically developed here is that we've seen that people really want to rush up to about 6 p.m. So 6 p.m. is where they, that's their golden zone, right? That's the mage with, with 
two spheres at five and one at three. You okay. know, they're very useful. Uh, it's more like two at four and one at three. They're very useful. Um, but our hand, your our hand also does begin to have negative effects because just like you said with, with it, it actually, that is a really good analogy for a high hour character that I didn't even put together. But yes, a, a mage who is sitting at, you know, six or seven paradox that he hasn't bled off. And just by being near him, the world does not, is not stable anymore. It's less that, and it's more that that character who's at not really 6 p.m., but 9 p.m. is so foreign to you because they're not just looking at the world through a person's eyes. They're looking at the world through every version of them throughout the multiverse's eyes. And so they're, they're bizarre and they make bad decisions. And it gets also it gets very hard for them to bleed off minutes. So, you know, you got an 11 o'clock character who's got an 11 o'clock power, they really can only blow it one time, which is great because the 11th hour contracts in this game are world changing. Consider them to be, and, and they are something that's within the reach of, of players, but consider them to be sphere seven or eight powers. Oh, okay. So they are, they are an archmage once. Yes. <laughs> one time. Uh, so you made mention of contracts. Is that the basic power mechanic of the game? It is. Uh, and what we decided that we wanted to do with contracts is we want to engage in power creep, obviously. As the hour hand goes up, you creep mm -hmm. power. But we also didn't want to make it where, you know, I, I'm playing a new character at this table. This game has been going for a year. This guy over here is 9 p.m. I just came in at 1 p.m. and I can't play. Mm -hmm. um, so the most powers that your character, the most contracts that your character will ever be able to have is five. You choose a first third, fifth, seventh, ninth, and 11th hour contract. Uh, and those contracts are bonkers. Like, they're very powerful. Okay. So you mentioned that these characters are the touched. Is that a supernatural type? Like, for instance, is everyone in this universe possible to be one of these character types? Is there something special about them in addition to them? Are there other, what in Mage I would refer to as night folk running around, or does everyone in this world kind of have access to the same power scheme? The touched are people who experienced a run-in specifically with the sort of grand villains of the game. And the grand villains are what we call dread beings. In our world, in our, in our, in our mythology, when the Big Bang occurred, it created not just our universe, but uh, a dizzying number, nearly infinite number of multiverses uh, or, or universes. It's one multiverse that it created all these universes. In the universe that the Midnight World is set in, something went wrong. When the Big Bang happened, an infinite number of universes were born, and most of them didn't survive. But they're still there. They still exist somewhere out there in the multiverse, and we call those the corpse universes. They don't really exist, but they definitely don't not exist. They're somewhere between potentiality and reality. And in some of those places, life of a kind has begun to form or has formed over the eons. The worst of those pieces of life are the dread beings, which probably the best analogy for mage would be that the dread beings are all in Karna, and they are not necessarily evil, but just like in Karna and mage are not necessarily evil, they're so powerful and eternal that the average mortal wouldn't know the difference between a good one and a bad one. They're, they're capricious, they're they don't see us as anything. They don't see us as ants. We're not even molecules to them. And they're out there in these weird corpse universes having their own battles between each other. And most physical realities deny them entry based on this thing called the Twilight Veil, which is a, a metaphysical shield that, that just stops them from coming into physical reality. In, in the same way that the consensus prevents the things that should not be from intruding from Malpheus. Well, with the exception that in the Midnight World, the Twilight Veil was damaged. It wasn't destroyed, but it was damaged. So the, the Dread Beings still cannot fully physically enter the Midnight World. But what they can do is they can reach across and they can put things, put fragments of their will here. And so we use a lot of chaos magic terminology in our in our game so they can put servitors and egregores their actual chaos magic terminology because i thought chaos magic was cool when i was in high school those dread beings will occasionally put one of their fragments near enough to a human that the human experiences it 
And that is what causes that person to become attached. They immediately and without air have the understanding that the multiverse is a real thing. They may not know it as the multiverse, but they know they saw a horrible monster. And based on their understanding that physical reality is not the only thing out there, they can begin to exhibit powers. Not everyone who sees something go bump in the night is going to become one of these entities. Correct. For those not familiar necessarily with chaos magic, a servitor is the idea that there is a psychological complex, an arrangement of emotions and thoughts or something created by uh, the magician for a specific purpose that operates autonomously from the magician's consciousness. It is this, this kind of thought form, which makes it very similar to an egregore, which first entered mage formally, I think, in Book of the Fallen recently. Consult our interview on the topic. Where, to me, uh, egregores are more a collective event so an individual can create a servitor but the gestalt of a community can create this thought form entity that is out there my favorite version of using that in mage was a neighborhood where houses were being broken into because people that were different than the dominant ethnicity there started moving in and people just thought crime was going to rise and it did because they were convinced it was they were actually their homes were actually being broken into and robbed by their collective belief that their homes were going to be broken into and robbed. Chaos magic has been around since the, I want to say the 70s was when it became uh, sort of its own mystical discipline. And mm-hmm. we, we mind it very heavily because in, 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 our, in our world, it's the same thing. The dread beings are able to break off fragments of their will and create these autonomous sort of almost like robots. Servitors generally will leave people alone. They're there to do a specific task. They're not If you get in their way, they will fight you. But egregores are basically when a group of servitors come together to solve a problem. And now you've got a sentient or a pseudo-sentient, there are these extra planar monstrosities that will send bits of themselves into our world to accomplish a task. And when your character, your character didn't just hear something go bump in the night, and they didn't just go downstairs and see something they thought might possibly look like a werewolf. They went downstairs and watched a werewolf rip their mom's face off. That's clearly much worse. So that is how they, they came into the ownership of these new bizarre powers. To translate that into mage, we have a Malfian or a Gelidian in Nephondic terms. It has a bunch of mortals that worship it and demand the presence of their dark god, not realizing what it is. It answers their prayers, and this demon entity enters in the form of an egregore. They ask it to do something, and it sends little bits of itself out into the world to make change, and that would be the servitor in that case? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, servitors are... Like I said, they will attack you if you get too close to them, if you bug them, or if they're programmed to attack you. If uh, one of the dread beings we have is the Taker, and he's a being of pure putrescence, it wants to create death to, to glut itself. And so its servitors may just kill people, because why not? It just wants to create rot. But they also may not. But its egregores are generally pretty awful damn things to be around. So in addition to that, we can look at this as an option for a, for lack of a better term, a monster manual. If the systems aren't enough for you, there is a cosmology that you can grab and put in your game that may be interesting, especially if you want to have some dark servants of some outer evil thing and you want to have rules and such for their agents and so on. Uh, this is something else that you could grab. There's also just a, a moment for a shameless plunk here. Even if, you know, if, even if you're not too interested in... Um, in the minute world as its own core rule system, but you do want to bring some of these ideas in. When we hit $25,000, we will write Beyond the Veil, a guide to creating your own dread beings, which will have a very similar rolling mechanic to our memory blocks. I have also broken down monster stories, and I figured out, I think, a really good system to create monsters based on these blocks. And you've kind of tied the supernatural with anxiety. Do these systems apply to people that don't have powers? They do. So the the distress mechanic is something that can be added as a template to anybody in the game. We do actually have one player character type that doesn't, it's not a type, it's actually, uh, it's it's a challenge that you start the game with. And the challenge is untouched. If you're, un, and it's a, it's a challenge because if you're untouched, that is bonkers that you're experiencing this for the first time with a group of people who have at least seen it before. And the untouched still can accrue distress dice, which are the D4s, but 
they don't have a trigger that builds them rapidly. So they'll see something like, a, oh, wow, that's a that's a dead body. I've not seen a dead body before. And they will gain distress off of that. But they are not this. One of the one of the trauma triggers is the sound of distant music. That alone will not cause them to start gaining this distress because we they also will not have access to the kinds of the toolkit that the touched have. So their anxiety is there and it's just not as dangerous to them. A non-touched person, an untouched person will never have five distress dice on anything. But at the same time, they don't have dread contracts. They're generally never really going to go higher than three or four in any specific ability or, or attribute. They're just sort of I think untouched people can only ever have one skill or attribute at five, can't have both, and they can only ever have two at four, whereas a touched person does not have to follow those rules. Now, do you worry at all the fact that these mechanics that will help convey this are kind of done in a supernatural setting, and it's kind of presented that, oh, the only people that are utterly crippled by this also have superhuman powers. Do you worry at all that that trivializes the experience or maybe fundamentally misrepresents it? Because, like, when I have a panic attack and I take an Alprazolam, like, I don't have, there's no, the other end of that. I don't have access to dread contracts. Right. Uh, so is there any worry about representing it in a certain way that may fundamentally miss something? I Actually, that's a really good question. And, and, no. Uh, yes and no. I mean, uh, yes. <laughs> you're wrong and you're stupid, Robinson. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, we misrepresent it, but we also do it on purpose. And there's okay. a sidebar in the book about that specifically. Why do normal people not have the same level of anxiety as the untouched? The reason for that is because there are two reasons. The first reason is we want to make it very clear that our game is about fighting monsters. Yes, it is about dealing with PTSD, dealing with anxiety and depression learning to harness your power in a world where these terrible things have happened to you at the same time you win in our game y yes you have this terrible crushing weight of supernatural levels of anxiety but you also have a strength within you that allows you to defeat it and we are hoping that people see that the sort of allegory here is that the same is true of everybody. I don't have supernatural anxiety, but I do as a person have the tools necessary to defeat the anxiety that I have. The other reason that we chose to make it distinct that separation between supernatural and non-supernatural is because our game absolutely deals with things that may be actually triggering to people at your table. We have a whole sidebar on that. That's one of the reasons we suggest that character creation be done together, because if this guy sitting over here ends up with a trauma trigger that is too close to something that someone at the table really actually is triggered by, you can discuss and change it. But also, we don't want a trauma trigger to ever be anything that is that close to something that really happened to you. At that point, it's not role-playing. Right. That, that, at the point, it's causing actual harm to a player. It, it's very important to us to make a distinction between player and character. Your character is suffering. The player should never suffer. So part of the reason that we make it like this, that we make all of the – to be touched, it has to have been a supernatural event. It has to have been something beyond the pale of mortal understanding because otherwise we run the risk of saying, okay, cool. Your character is in this game and, and is, is exposed to this trauma track because in Iraq in 2004, someone threw a hand grenade to the back of your truck and blew part of your leg off. And my brother would go, uh, hey, that really happened to me. That did really happen to him, by the way. And he wouldn't be able to be there. It would cause him actual mm -hmm. harm. To a certain extent, we wanted this to be a game about superheroes who overcome. And I will tell you something else that, you know, I – you, you can really sort of see it in the, in the game itself, but characters don't lose in our game. We have a couple of mechanics that we've put in place to help this be, and I want to say it's a therapeutic experience because I feel like that does overly simplify and, and, and is very reductive. It's a game. It's not therapeutic. 
But in our game, your character can't die just because they run out of hit points. Your character can't die just because the storyteller wants them to. You as a player have to consent to their death. You have options when your character falls to zero hit points. Uh, you have three options and only one of them is death. Also, you don't have to roll a success on a roll to make a thing you want happen happen. There are ways around failing rolls and stuff like that. And we very specifically wanted to make this an empowering game. It's hard, right? It's hard to skate that line between we want to tell you that our game sells the idea of dealing with PTSD, but at the same time, we don't want to actually trigger your PTSD. Well, the thing that's coming across to me is, to me, the way I, I divvy up games is, what is your ascent up Mount Plot look like? In an action-adventure game, you are going to get to the top of Mount Plot, or you're going to get to at least a Butte or Mesa that is reasonably high. And the thing that makes the game interesting is you may have to go down to go back up again. You may lose some companions along the way. It may take way longer than you anticipate. In a horror game, you may not get up Mount Plot. Right. And from what it describes in this game is you can get up Mount Plot, but some of the adversaries in this case may literally be forces outside of the cosmos, and some of them may be internal and intensely personal. And that yes. journey will not be easy, but the journey can be made if everyone is willing to do it. And it is one of the cases where the storyteller does not have the option of saying, you're climbing too fast. I'm kicking you down Mount Plot. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, 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 and as a storyteller, that has made a lot of the games that I've run very interesting because I've had uh, groups of characters kick the absolute crap out of my plot, and I've had them barely succeed. But I've also found it, in my opinion, of course, I'm selling the praises of my own game, but I've also found that as a, as a lifelong storyteller, it is easier for me to tell stories in my game because they take a lot of that pressure off of me. If I know where this game kind of ends, it, it does generally in with the characters succeeding at what they're trying to do it takes a lot of the pressure off of me to figure out well what if they don't well don't worry about it they do it, basically when you lay out a story in the midnight world you say these are the beats of the story and somebody comes along and says well what if they don't get to the end well but they will though because i'm not going to kill them between now and then yeah they may get to the end with two guys in the party having one of their arms torn off and a guy's blind and the other guys can't stop vomiting like it may suck, but they're going to yeah. get there. <laughs> and there is a difference between surviving and uh, and victory, as it were. Okay, so you've walked us through a bunch of interesting things that mage storytellers can get. So a uh, quick overview. You have a simplified merit and flaw system where it lets you pick up little bits and pieces. Because in mage, even a one-point flaw can be pretty po problematic. Bard's tongue, one-point flaw. You always tell the truth or say something that is inconvenient to the point where you have to succeed at a willpower roll or you literally bite through your own tongue. You have a system for the representation of trauma. You use novel dice combinations to do that, which is something a World of Darkness storyteller can do, where as accumulate stress or maybe you lose willpower, you add D4s that can only add to your botch total. They can only add ones and make this right. kind of dramatic failure more present. You have a power mechanic that is also tied to you being disconnected from the world. So a mage storyteller could look at it and say, hey, you've gained a rete, but you're also gaining paradox. And this is what the interaction of the two are going to look like. Like you've become very powerful, but somewhat unmoored from reality. I mean, it's like the the most the most uh, the most powerful mages in the game can't exist on the mortal plane anymore. They have to. Well, prior to 1992, they would go to Horizon because they just couldn't exist here anymore. And yeah, and as marauders are represented, if your quiet score is high enough, you just kind of fall out of reality. And the Mage Storyteller Guide, uh, Storyteller Handbook, even presents an alternative four-axis system that if any of those power attributes gets too high, you kind of, reality kind of shoves you out of it for the consensus to defend itself. Uh, you provide a alternate cosmology, which seems like it would in no way necess necessitate getting rid of the World of Darkness cosmology, but if you wanted to have a multiverse view, you could introduce it. You could also use it as a avenue to add a new group of mages to the game that think that the root of their power is their ability to tap into these extra planar entities, and they have seen the true truth, which has kind of driven them a little bit off their rocker, but also seemingly grants them great power. Uh, you've solved the attribute plus ability, dice pool being a dice pool thing. What does the experience system look like if there is one? That's the thing. There's not one. Your character's growth is entirely tied to that clock. At each 
odd hour, you gain a power, and each even hour, you gain more points to to spend on skills and attributes. Now, that said, one of the things you've brought up that is that is very true is that, look, you know, we don't feel comfortable just because of the vast differences we've we've built into the game now. We don't feel comfortable saying that this is a modified storytelling system or storyteller system. It's not, but it is close enough to that or even Shadowrun that if you wanted to lift, you know, hey, you know, I want to run this mage game and I want to run a, a version of mage horror, but I don't want to bother with a different dice mechanic and I, but I really like the clock. You could just lift that clock and just make it do exactly the same thing. Uh, you know, short of experience points, but you can mm-hmm. make it do a- as you go up in hours. Hours are tied to Arate, and as you go up in Arate, you become more out of touch with the world and distress, and you add distress. You could do all of that very, very easily, uh, because that's how we originally built the game, is it was an add-on, a, a, paint, a coat of paint over the top of a World of Darkness game. We've simplified a lot of the things that we didn't like, like having way too many powers, or having powers that felt like they didn't really have any utility, or, you know, whatever, but it would be very, very easy to sort of read through our game, pick up the core mechanics that you really like, and just add them as a splash of paint over the top of your mage game. Are there any other design questions that you think your game has a particularly clever or interesting or thematic solution to that people from the World of Darkness may go, oh, that's interesting, I want to grab this book and learn more about this? The first thing that we did when we realized we were going to develop our own system is we developed a list of design philosophies. And those design philosophies, in a lot of cases, were built around things in the world of darkness that we wanted to tune up. So our sheet is vastly simplified compared to one of the four-page Mr. Gone vampire sheets. Not to say that I wouldn't love Mr. Gone. Mr. Gone, if you're listening, please develop a sheet for our game. Um, <laughs> but but it's, our sheet tends to be a little bit more simple um our character creation even if you decide to you know our character creation is super fast even if you decide to build your own character even if you decide not to use the random generator because instead of doing well these are 13 5 9 and these are 7 5 3 and these are no no no. our attributes 3 2 1 our skills 3 3 2 2 2 1 1 1 1 done and then choose one one o'clock power choose a challenge choose a privilege and that's it your character's done and and write your memory uh and your character is done so we wanted to make character creation something that you could do basically that the original design philosophy behind character creation and and we actually have a storytelling that's i'm going to go ahead and unveil it it's going to be part of one of the stretch goals we have built uh, we have a boiled storytelling down into the same basic blocks of how stories are told i have read about a thousand hours of joseph campbell and dan Harmon (laughs) and other big storytellers to make sure that i felt like i was developing it correctly we wanted the storyteller or you know five friends who are sitting at home on a rainy night and they want to play a horror game and they don't know what game they want to play don't know who wants to storytell they all get together they decide storyteller rolls six times on a chart he's got a story and a monster players all roll six times on a chart they've got their characters and you go. Character creation and story creation are probably the things, the other big design philosophies that we have that I, I feel like are an improvement over World of Darkness, which if any of my friends who helped develop the World of Darkness are listening, that's not a criticism of you guys. You guys are amazing. Well, it's one of those things where I like saying stories haven't changed in the past couple of centuries, but storytelling has. And we're dealing with a 30-year-old system. I mean, we are one year from the 10th anniversary of the 20th anniversary of Vampire the Masquerade. Mm -hmm. And games have made progress in terms of what makes a game fast and playable. The stories that we tell may not have changed hugely, but the way in which we tell them, we've come up with low-friction ways to do that. So I, I can't imagine any designer from the 90s gets insulted when someone says, hey, I think we found a better way to tie theme, mood, and system together. Everyone has to be a pioneer, and World of Darkness was one of those pioneers, and we, we fully recognize the work that the Wick brothers and Mark Rain Hagen and Justin Achille and Satoris Fabricato and, and so on did in developing those games, and we've come up with new tools. Uh, that would be like being angry that someone came up with a, a better cell phone. Or like, ah, you're replacing what I did. Thank you for right. what you did, but still, progress exists, and we can advance. And also, if, if you've played V5 yet, but I am 
super, super hopeful that they will make a mage, all of the lines really, based oh, yeah. on, on the new vampire system. They've done something very similar to what we've done by uh, the introduction of Hunger Dice. Their Hunger Dice system is very, very cool. I would love to see Paradox Dice come in uh, as as the mage version of that same thing. I think that the World of Darkness specifically has a strong future ahead of it in its current hands. We're just going to try real hard to outsell them. So. Yeah. <laughs> So we've talked about this game. If someone wants to go buy it, how do they do that? Uh, so right now we are in the middle of our, our Kickstarter. Uh, our Kickstarter will run until the end of the month, March 29th. Now I'm going to tell you how much of a Luddite I am. I accidentally launched the Kickstarter four days early because at, at midnight on a Thursday because uh, – there's this button and it said you got you got to get everything in six to eight days early so that we can review it to make sure it be, it meets our content guidelines and I'm like okay so me and Jim sat down and we drank a bunch of wine and we wrote it out and we designed the Kickstarter and we're like cool and there's a button on the bottom that says do you want to launch and I'm like well it says I had to review it right so I clicked it and then 30 seconds later we had a backer and I'm like oh no <laughs> oh no so even with that even we launched at 12:48 Thursday night Friday morning <laughs> Four days before any of our promotional material, we funded in 22 hours. People were excited. They wanted to see what we have to, to offer the world. And you can find us on Kickstarter. Just search for The Midnight World. Um, you can find us on Facebook at The Midnight World. You can find us on Twitter at The Midnight WOR1 because, again, I'm a Luddite. And we are on Reddit, but I don't know how Reddit works. So, yeah. <laughs> search for The Midnight World and James Davian. It'll probably pop right. up. Uh, once the Kickstarter has run, we anticipate that the book should be done by around early September. It'll have to go to Drive Through RPG for content review. I by the end of September, you should be able to buy it on Drive Through RPG. We're not sure whether we're going to release it on other digital distribution platforms yet. I suspect that it is likely, but right now we're really because this is our first project. We're really focused on what we know. And that's drive through. And we will actually have it in some gaming stores. We have a couple of retailers who have bought retail copies. And we hope that by this time next year, you should be able to find it at at least some gaming stores throughout the U.S. So for $60, we get a hardcover of the book and a PDF copy and a, a mention within the book, which is pretty standard for a price point of a, of a nice eight and a half by 11 book that we are used to seeing of maybe up to 300 pages. How big is this sucker going to be? You, you would get access to the hardcover copy first at 45 bucks. That's not without, that's without all the extra cool stuff, 45 okay. bucks. And we think we're going to MSRP for 45 bucks, 40 to 45 bucks. And the reason for that, yeah, it is going to be somewhere between 260 to 320 pages. Um, the main reason that we can't tell you for sure what that number is going to be just yet is because one of – and this is something that is, I hammer on very, very hard as an independent developer. One of our uh, uh, core business philosophies was even though Jenny Loopy uh, Smith Pulsifer, who is one of uh, – she's been editing especially World of Darkness and Onyx Path books for a very long time. She's very good at it. She's also a really dear friend of mine. And when I said I would like to hire you for my book, she said, uh, cool – well, what do you think you can pay me? And I said, no, no, no. What is your rate? That is what I will pay you. And we sort of shot ourselves in the foot a little bit because we refused to accept any friends or family discounts. We paid our artist, our editor, our graphic layout, everybody at their full professional rate. It was very, very important for us to do that. So that said, we have a bunch of content but that's going to that's going to really depend on which stretch goals we make and which which ones we don't make. And I would say that right now you're looking at a a core book that is pretty standard size somewhere between like I said that 250 and that 320 range. It's going to have obviously the full system is going to be in it. It's going to have uh, some lore you know, a, a pretty good, strong lore section, a section on storytelling in our world. It's also going to have uh, at least three, possibly four story modules that it starts with. Tons of really cool art by our amazing freaking artist. And yeah, we, we really hope we can actually push it up even further. But again, that will totally depend on where that Kickstarter ends. And for people who are interested, all of those links and all the pages that uh, James mentioned will be in our show notes. Click there or go to magethepodcast.com. Uh, and with that, is there anything else you'd like to add or any other projects that you're working on that you'd like our audience to know about, James? 
Uh, I'm not looking, or we're not working on any other projects now. The only thing we will say is that depending upon the success of the Midnight World and just by looking at where a Kickstarter is now, I feel like I can pretty confidently say this will not be our last project. We do have stuff in the works and that that's about it. I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you so much, man. Gladly. And thank you so much. If you've enjoyed this interview and this is the first episode that you've subs- listened to, please subscribe. Go to magethepodcast.com. We're available on Spotify, iTunes, and a number of other podcatchers. If you've enjoyed it, drop us a line, magethepodcast at gmail.com. If you have any ideas or criticisms or comments and you want to tweet at us, at magethepodcast. Additionally, if you'd like to join the conversation about mage, hit us up, discord.me slash magethepodcast. And with that, Terry out.